All right. Here we are again for another exciting live stream with yours truly, Bennett Prescott. I am the Sales and Operations Manager for BNC Speakers North America. I manage uh, all of our OEMs as well as our distribution office in New Jersey. And uh, I am slightly qualified to talk about this sort of stuff because I really like loudspeakers. I've been doing this for a while now, more than a decade for sure, more like almost two. And uh, uh, I used to be uh, a measurement tech, uh, and then I took basically this desk job, which does not keep me at a desk very often, except today and uh, since the beginning of the year. So. Let's make the mess of it, everybody, and uh, I got my coffee, I got uh, some microphones, I got a bunch of lights, and uh, three devices to, to make this stuff work. Let's get going. So first, let's talk about BNC Speakers. Uh, that company was founded in 1945. Uh, it's now publicly traded, and it's still family-controlled. Lorenzo Capini and his family own um, something like 60% of the company. The rest is out there, so you could buy some if you wanted to. Uh, it's been doing pretty well, so I might recommend it, but uh, don't take stock advice from me. In 2017, we bought 18 Sound and Chiare, another two really great storied pro audio brands. So now we have two factories, employ more than 200 people. Um, one's near Florence, one's near Bologna, and our capacity is about a million transducers a year, which makes us by far the largest pro audio transducer supplier. This tech talk is about transducer design, and I think there's uh, uh, some information about transducers that people don't uh, really think about necessarily in the correct way, because I think a lot of people come to it from a, a teal small parameter or a simulation based on teal small parameters perspective. And uh, I, I would rather people came to it from, from a manufacturer's perspective, which is how do we design the uh, highest performance transducer and let's worry about how to make it work in a box later, which sounds a little backwards, but I'm going to try and convince you that it's not. Uh, BNC does a lot of transducers. We do 180 closed projects a year, closed woofer projects alone. So compression drivers are a, a bit of a different story because they have a lot more uh, complexity in them and it takes a lot longer to iterate them. But woofer is basically every other day we close as in the customer can now buy this uh, a woofer project. There's a lot more going on in the in the background, and of course we're testing materials and manufacturing techniques and things like that. But uh, it's 180 new SKUs a year, and we build about 4,000 unique SKUs a year. That could be anything from a complete uh, custom SKU to a retail SKU you're familiar with to a label or a small impedance change. Uh, no way of knowing. Uh, the thing to remember about woofers in particular is that they're uh, very Basic. They're made out of basic materials. They're made out of cloth. They're made out of rubber. They're made out of uh, wire and steel and copper and aluminum. So uh, in, in the end, it's a lot of kind of uh, trying to make the best of a relatively uh, mature technology. And it's not that common that we come up with something that's significantly better. So often we're trying to fight for one, one and a half dB. And some of the changes that we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about in this presentation are, are on that order. Finding, finding a one dB sensitivity or, or rather efficiency increase in a woofer uh, is a really big deal but doesn't seem like that big a deal on a, on a spec sheet. Uh, and we do do a lot of simulation, uh, which is, uh, of course, very important, and it's especially important for motor structures. Uh, it's really important for compression drivers. Uh, the old logo. I don't think we have an old logo. It's just the, the not two-tone one. It's our, it's our more colorful logo. Uh, uh, anyway, simulation is really important, and more importantly, we have a deep understanding of how to tie simulation to real-world results, which is different from just simulating. Um, and it does save a lot of time and gives us a good starting point and helps us find things that we might have done wrong, but in the end, you have to test a lot of woofers to destruction. So for every uh, retail woofer that you see in our lineup, we've probably destroyed 50 to 100 of them. Uh, certainly built that many, and that's to try and make sure that they'll meet their power tests, to try a bunch of durability things, uh, and also just to make sure if we assemble uh, a bunch of different wo woofers from different batches that they uh, we can kind of figure out what the long-term teal small parameters are going to be and the long-term QC window. So let's talk about uh, first amplifiers, which are a pretty important uh, part of the loudspeaker equation and what's changed over the last uh, 
60, 70 years. Uh, the state of the art back in 1967, after BNC was about 25 years old, uh, was the DC 300. It was the first real sort of touring durable amplifier. Uh, had a really good PowerPoint. I think it was fully class A, but maybe it was class AB. I don't, I don't remember. And uh, uh, it was a, a famous for being a dollar a watt back then. And for some reason, also, it passed DC. I don't know why anybody thought that was a good idea, but it did. Uh, that same amplifier today is more like $8 a watt. Um, and uh, now the, the kind of equivalent top-of-the-line touring amplifier is probably PowerSoft's X4L, uh, which they don't pay me to pimp, by the way. So if anybody has an idea, uh, I, I do take donations to... Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Please don't send me money. Um, and uh, Oh, Class AB. Thanks, Scott. The uh, so the PowerSoft uh, amplifier is uh, 58 cents a watt today, and of course it's half the height, uh, about the same weight, and produces uh, 28 times more power. Plus it's got DSP limiting, networking. It's a real kind of do everything integrated system for controlling a uh, a loudspeaker enclosure. So meanwhile. Uh, you may have seen this slide before, since I really enjoyed it once I put it together. Uh, if you look at the equivalent specifications in a loudspeaker, and this is kind of what people look at, these are teal small parameters, um, they don't really look that different. This is a D130 from 1955. It's a paper cone, paper spider, paper, um, paper former. And, uh, okay, our, our modern equivalent with silicone, double silicone spider and uh, Nomex former and that sort of stuff, treated cloths around and, you know, super modern motor design. Uh, it can handle more power, but it doesn't exactly have a lot more X max. And I don't know, is 26 BLs a lot more than 18? I, I don't really know. Um, otherwise, kind of looks, kind of looks pretty similar. Similar QTS, impedance, FS. I mean, what's, what's really the difference here? Um, so... Clearly something has changed because it's been 60 years uh, and amplifiers have improved a lot. And if you plugged uh, the old D130 into a modern amplifier, it would it would really probably set your house on fire pretty quickly. Oh yeah, thanks Nathan. We got a lot of, uh, Nathan sent us a D130 uh, and we, uh, we got the teal small parameters off of it. Um, and uh, I asked them to do some more tests, but they're pretty backed up. So I was, I was hoping to get some, some real thermal characteristics out of it, but... No, no joy yet. Uh, so when you, when you look at the commonly used parameters that are used to judge woofers, it seems like uh, nothing has changed in 60 years, but of course we know that's not really uh, the case. Uh, so where do these parameters come from, these Teal small parameters? Well, they come from two guys named Teal and Small. Uh, Teal is a Australian guy, and Small saw his work back in the uh, 60s and actually moved to Australia to work with him and then brought them to the attention of the AES. Uh, and basically what they they are models of, uh, uh, they're a way to characterize a woofer and then develop a mathematical model of that woofer that you can use to, to solve equations. Uh, and you have to remember, this was uh, all what technology was available in 1960. So there are no computers, no pocket calculators, uh, if you want to find out what your final acoustic response is going to be, you need to either plot it point by point by hand, which is extremely time consuming, or you can solve an equation, which is what made it way faster and say, hey, I want this response and I have this box. What transducer do I need or vice versa? Uh, and so it's important to keep those parameters uh, in the correct context. And the correct context is that back then, there were very, very limited resources. There was practically no EQ to do what we can do in a 1U amplifier today. Um, you would need a rack of equipment. Maybe somebody remembers the DBX drive rack ads from, uh, oh shit, 15 years ago. And uh, they'd show what you needed to do, what a, a drive rack 260 or something could do. And it was like uh, just an entire rack of equipment. Um, so they, they didn't have any of that rack of equipment. They had very, very limited, mostly passive tools to work with and extremely low power amplifiers. So um, an amplifier that could do 50 watts, sorry, 50 volts was, was a really big deal. And so you really had to conserve every volt you could get. And so they were focused on the sensitivity response uh, of the loudspeaker more than anything else because they pretty much had to make it flat out of the box if they wanted to get uh, a usable response. 
Um, and so that's what those equations let them do. Those equations, the teal small parameters, let you calculate for flat sensitivity. And uh, they're, they're simply not valid in a lot of modern contexts, like anything more than a watt. Because um, if the coil moves, suddenly you're looking at a different set of parameters, because uh, what the Wolfrey does when it starts to get going is a, is a whole different question. Uh, so here's a little more uh, on, on the teal small parameters. This is the actual teal small model we use for the, I think it's the 18 SW115. So you can see the, the black trace in the, in the background there is the real free air impedance uh, of the, or it might be in a sealed box, I'm not sure. Uh, of the 18SW115, and then you basically write an equation that follows that trace as closely as possible. And if you make the equation more complex, you can take into account some more things like uh, inductive rise at higher frequencies and things like that. Most of the teal small parameters you see people using are quite simple and really only um, take into account the, uh, the, the width of that peak and the height of that peak, and that pretty much defines the parameters that you get out of them. Um, so uh, the key parameters you can get out of that, uh, or, by, or by doing some derivation, is uh, are, are the uh, re DC resistance of the voice coil, which a lot of the parameters are based on, uh, the resonant frequency of the woofer, which you can see here is right about 40 hertz, um, the compliance of the suspension, the mass of all the moving parts, including the, the thin layer of air around them that you have to include, um, and the one we're going to talk about a lot today, which is BL, which is you can kind of think of as horsepower. It's how much power the uh, motor structure can apply to the coil in use. Um, so if, if you imagine this is actually an EQ peak, that's kind of what you're doing with the teal small parameters. You're fiddling around with your, your uh, Q and your bandwidth and your gain until you match the, the, the teal small model to the shape that you've measured. And if you have uh, two parametrics, you can get a little closer, three parametrics maybe. I don't think anybody uses more than that, uh, but that's, that's what you're doing here. Um, and take note that there's, there are no parameters to do with high power. There's no power handling, no excursion, no distortion. Those are not teal small parameters. Uh, and all those parameters are linked. So if you want to reduce MMS, which is the mass of the cone and the coil and the suspension and some air, uh, pretty much you either need to use super exotic materials, which in general are too expensive um, and maybe have resonance problems, or you need to just make the cone coil assembly lighter. And when you make it lighter, you make it less durable. Uh, <laughs> Peter Maxwell Rossola, you stay out of this discussion, please, with your, your torque versus horsepower. Torque is the only one that matters, of course. Um, so often we'll get requests to, to change parameters and we'll say, oh, okay, I, I, uh, I've got this woofer and it really needs to be lower FS according to my, my model. We'll say, okay, well, how are we going to accomplish that? We can make the suspension looser, but the suspension is pretty critical at keeping the coil centered. And so if you make the suspension looser, it's going to be bad at its primary job. And, okay, we can add mass, but everybody hates mass because it, uh, it makes the sensitivity go down broadband. And uh, so they say, oh, okay, well, I, I want lower FS without any added MMS. Uh, all right. Uh, in the end, we don't really think about woofer design in any of these terms um, because we aren't aiming for a specific FS, and we're not aiming for a specific MMS. We're using just the reasonable materials and aiming for um, aiming for more, usually more excursion and more BL. That's uh, pretty much what matters in the context of a subwoofer. If you're talking more like a mid-bass woofer, um, then, uh, then you may want to think some more about high frequencies. But in a subwoofer, certainly all that matters is BL and uh, XVAR which is uh, our way of talking about excursion. I'll, I'll talk more about it later. But anyway, all, all, these, all these terms are, are connected and you have to balance them because if you have uh, unlimited budget, then you can add on a lot more motor and you can make a better woofer that way. Or you can use, I don't know, pure beryllium for the diaphragm and that's really great, uh, but uh, that's a lot more budget. Or you can make it way bigger. If you don't care about size and weight, you can get away with a lot. You can make a much deeper structure uh, and that lets you get a lot more excursion too. Uh, but uh, 
usually people care a lot about uh, the price they pay and the size and the weight and the performance they're going to get. So it all has to be very carefully balanced. It's much more like a, a race car than, oh, I'm just going to buy a minivan uh, versus the, the sedan you might have had before. Um, and again, a lot of these parameters, people will pick one and they say, hey, I, I need this parameter to change um, for this reason, because they're looking at a, a measurement, they're looking at a, a simulation, and if they change that parameter, their simulation improves, but what they're not taking account of is that uh, by changing that parameter, they could be damaging the sound quality or the durability or the performance of the woofer just to meet a, um, a sensitivity spec. Uh, Phil, I, I think these are taken free air. Um, uh, Rick, I'll explain that a, a little bit in just a few slides, actually. I'll talk some more about XVAR and why XVAR is, is a much more reliable than XMAX. Uh, so, uh, oh, yeah, I, gotta, I can show you my great unicorn. So everybody, the, the short story, or the long story, since that's what I've been talking about so far, is that everybody wants... Uh, flat response that everybody simulates for flat response and everybody expects the system to be flat but uh, They also don't want to use equalization and that doesn't really make sense uh, in a modern context where we have unlimited free equalization and it's a really powerful tool and It's pretty much everywhere and you've got amplifiers that have big volts So in the past if you could only do 50 volts, then you have to be careful how much you know equalization you apply because the EQ could reach the limits of your amplifier even if you're not actually putting that much power out you just run out of volts but nowadays uh, we have 175 volt amplifiers everywhere I mean uh, I just bought one they're really easy to find you can find uh, 200 plus volts pretty much as easily and so you're you're not really as limited as you used to be in terms of not putting too many volts into the woofer even if you're getting not much power in at that particular point um, so uh, I think that flat sensitivity view uh, and having the loudspeaker come flat out of the box uh, is, is not something that is really necessary anymore. And it's holding back people's um, designs. So this is more like how we think about loudspeaker design here at, at BNC and I assume pretty much every other major manufacturer is that it's, it's a lot like an engine that, you know, you don't think about... Uh, how do I make the engines, you know, uh, not rotate as hard uh, when under heavy torque or something? You think about how can I make it more durable and make it um, stronger and go farther faster? And so that's that's how we design woofers. It's okay, I've, especially subwoofers. I've got this woofer and I want it to be as stable as possible and as durable as possible over as high an excursion as possible with as much uh, torque as possible. Um, and if you can get more of those without compromising the other things, then you get a, a better woofer. Um, and it turns out, uh, if you make that better woofer, uh, it becomes less and less flat. Uh, and that, that often leads people to make compromises in their design choices because they've got a woofer that's less flat, even though it's a higher performance woofer. Uh, and they're not really thinking about the, the trade-off that they're making by saying, oh, I, hey, this woofer is great, but if it had less BL, uh, which I hear from time to time, and it really, I don't understand it because it's like, oh, I've got this really great race car, but it would be way faster if it had less horsepower. No, don't change anything else. The weight's great. Everything's great. Just give it less power because um, uh, that, that's not really how things, it's not really how things work. <laughs> Uh, so when we design woofers, we think about uh, them in more kind of pure terms and uh, uh, think about them as a piston and how to make the piston stronger and more linear and apply more power to that piston. And we focus on mostly the behavior of that woofer when it's at full throttle, when it's near its limits. Um, and uh, uh, well, it is like an electric car motor. It's just a linear motor. Uh, B-Force, I would say that there's no such thing as too much BL and I've never seen any evidence to the, the contrary. And I'm surprised to hear that from a person whose name is B-Force. Uh, I think more BL is always better, um, again, in a subwoofer context. Well, no, that's not true. More BL is always better, and you'll see this in a mid-range context later on. So if you're not talking about a subwoofer, maybe more X is not always better, but because uh, you have to make trade-offs. But there's really no trade-off in getting more BL aside from uh, cost. And eventually it may not be technically feasible. So here's here's the engine. Uh, 
Um, so there's a, a voice coil, uh, and the cone's excluded. I sort of drew it on the left there. Um, but this is just the coil immersed in the magnetic gap. You can see the magnet, um, and you can see a blow up of the, the windings immersed in the magnetic gap. And I want you to think about this because if you imagine the magnet, the magnet structure putting force on those coils that are immersed in the magnetic gap, as the coils move up and down, eventually they're going to begin to move out of that gap and they're going to have less and less magnet strength applied to them. And that's uh, a very important curve because it tells you a lot about how far you can hope to move the cone before you start to stop being able to control it. Um, so the, the mechanical system, which is the spider, the surround, then the cone, uh, they keep the coil centered in the gap. That's their job. Uh, that's, that's pretty much all they matter about. Thanks, stainless steel. I'll drink some coffee. I think the coffee may be not helping. Um, and uh, so the, they keep the coil moving in a, in a linear fashion in and out of the gap because you don't want it to rock at all or you, uh, you can hit physical limits really fast. Um, and they keep it centered when there's uh, not any force applied to it, when there's no, uh, no volts going in, no current being applied. And that, that centering is also pretty important in, the, in this dimension. So this is the cone. And it needs to stay centered here, and it needs to not rock. Uh, and that's what the suspension does. The electrical system does pretty much everything else. It drives the coil, it restores the coil to center, it provides the majority of excursion control. Um, and so if you can get more uh, strength out of the motor, you can control the whole mechanical system a lot better. And so there's a, there's a number of reasons why more BL is better, but it also will get you a better damped system. And damping is the one thing that's really hard to come by. People talk about uh, impulse responses to something as, as a measure of, of how good a system is, but I think how fast it can come to rest is the most important characteristic, and that's something that you can get uh, by adding BL. And again, there's not really a trade-off to adding more BL aside from expense. So here's uh, the tool that we use. These are a bunch of uh, real Klippel slides of our, uh, I think this is the uh, 18TBX100. Um, but you can see that compared to the teal small parameters, there's pages and pages and pages of information here. And that information is everything from how every parameter changes uh, as the cone moves with the coil in and out of the gap, um, up to uh, the DC offset of the whole system, which is quite important and not included in teal small parameters, uh, power handling, real... Uh, uh, it boils down to uh, degrees Kelvin rise per watt, which is a really helpful parameter to know. Uh, so basically we design the woofer using a mix of uh, knowledge and uh, simulation, and then we make it, and then we test it with Klipple to see how, how it's actually doing under, under heavy use. Um, and we always do this. There's no such thing as a sample that comes out of BNC that hasn't been built and tested. We don't... Uh, we don't just simulate and then say, yeah, we think we can do this. We always build them because um, it always ends up being really critical. Uh, Crash PC CZ, we have done some work on uh, a linear suspension system. It turns out it's really noisy uh, and, again, really expensive. Um, and people are... Uh, it, it hasn't yet offered us enough of an advantage to, uh, to consider putting it in a commercial product. Um, so after we take all this Clipple data, then we can use Clipple to generate a, uh, uh, the teal small parameters that we publish, but they're just a, they're all of these per, these, these data points at one point at rest, which is not really useful in seeing how the woofer is going to do, uh, once you really start to beat on it, which is pretty much what everybody should be caring about. Um, so, uh, I'm going to focus on BL and later we'll talk a little bit about suspension stiffness. Um, but I, f I think the BL is, uh, A, the, the one that has the most misconceptions about it, and uh, B, the easiest one to describe. So this curve you see on the right is the um, BL over X curve. So it's the BL, which is the amount of force applied to the coil windings, as the coil is at every position. So if you push down all the way on the cone, the coil is going to move all the way in, and you're going to be at the left side of the graph. And if you pull up on the cone or push up on the cone, it's going to move through zero all the way up to the outermost point. And if at every point you take the um, BL and then you graph it, 
you'll get a graph that looks a lot like this one and it shows you uh, the motor force applied to the coil as it moves all the way in and out. This is our 18 uh, SW115 subwoofer which has split coil technology and you can see the advantage of that split coil technology is that the BL curve is super flat for about plus or minus 10 millimeters of excursion, which it turns out is where the coil is going to spend most of its time. And so it's a really important place to linearize. And linearizing the BL there means uh, it's just one less parameter that's changing and it's a much more stable system. Uh, uh, yeah, Greg, these are, the, these are the large signal parameters. So this is part of the Clipple LSI report for this, uh, this particular woofer. Um, if you think of this as kind of a hill and you put a marble on the top of it, the the marble has a nice linear place to roll along without suddenly dropping off to one side or the other. And the woofer sort of behaves like that also in that um, you, uh, if you can make that, that curve as flat as possible for as far as possible, then uh, the woofer will be more stable and will will not try to seek center or avoid center. It'll it'll behave a lot better over a long time when you uh, when you're using it. Um, and and remember, all of the parameters, every single one changes uh, not only with coil position but also with time, with heat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Clipple is one of the tools we use to understand how those parameters behave. Um, but uh, BL is is kind of one of the easiest ones to 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 imagine, I think. Uh, so here's a little more detail on those graphs. This is the um, 18SW115 again. Uh, and you can see there's two contributing graphs. Uh, so th this is returning to talking about XVAR and how XVAR is different from XMAX. So the way XMAX is calculated is someone takes uh, some equation, and usually it's something like uh, the coil height times half the gap height plus a quarter or something like that. and it's a, a, a just it depends on only coil height and it doesn't include anything like the suspension behavior or the motor behavior um, and so you can you could have a system that had zero uh, suspension excursion and a really long coil and you could say hey it's got 50 millimeters x max according to our mathematics but in fact it's got zero millimeters x max because it's made out of concrete so we prefer x var because it's based upon a repeatable empirical um, set of measurements that come out of Clipple like this. Um, and uh, the, the way we define XVAR is it's where the BL, the, sorry, the excursion at which the BL has either um, fallen by 50% or where the suspension stiffness has increased 50%. And so that way it includes the suspension as well. And it penalizes you if you don't have a very balanced BL and a very balanced suspension. So if you have a woofer with a lot of DC offset, uh, then you'll have a lower reportable XVAR than you would if you designed a more balanced system. And so it's still not kind of a true indicator of what the real limits of the woofer are. You can use it well beyond uh, XVAR for sure. It gets, uh, it's just you have to pick a point somewhere, draw your line in the sand and say this is where the woofer begins to be uh, nonlinear, really nonlinear. And that's what the XVAR figure means. And it's completely comparable between all of our uh, products. So you can you can take any two of our products, any two B and C 18 sound Chiari products, and compare the XVAR and see kind of oh, okay this one has more excursion available or, or less excursion available. Uh, one thing I want to point out is here's another way that teal small parameters are maybe not so useful. Um, if we didn't flatten the BL curve if we didn't split the coil in the middle to linearize the BL over a wide excursion range, we could report a higher BL number on our spec sheet. Right? If you just continue that curve, instead of pushing it down in the middle, then uh, we could say, hey, it's got 34 tesla meters BL uh, instead of the 28 we report, but it would be a way more unstable woofer and it would have many more uh, nonlinear distortions that you would hear. And a big part of why people really like the uh, SW series and why it quickly became sort of the touring subwoofer standard is that uh, it handles a lot of abuse really well, especially in small cabinets, and it does that because it's got a really wide uh, flat BL curve, and that's that's due to a, a large part of the coil, but also the magnetic uh, design. Uh, 
So back to my 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 favorite topic. Uh, do these teal small parameters provide a clear path to to higher performance loudspeaker systems? And are people kind of thinking about them the right way? Because if you add that BL that I've been suggesting everybody wants, uh, then you pay a price, and the price is that you get more efficiency, but you lose sensitivity. And you lose sensitivity because when you add the BL, uh, the impedance of the, the transducer raises up. So you're applying the same 2.8 volts or whatever, but now it's going into 10 ohms instead of 8. And so the frequency response, the sensitivity response drops. So as you add BL, as you stiffen the suspension system, as you basically make a higher performance transducer, um, the parameters and the simulations will lead you to believe that you've got a less flat transducer, which you do. Um, and people want flat transducers. But it turns out that, that the highest performance transducers we can build are, are not flat and become less flat as you make them higher performance um, in, in terms of sensitivity. Uh, but we're not designing for flat transducers anymore and we haven't been for 30, 40 years. Um, but a lot of people start that way and are trying to get a flat response out of the box, not considering DSP. Uh, if you think about it, there's no requirement that anything else uh, is flat. There's no requirement that the, uh, um, that the impedance is flat. There's no requirement that the velocity of the cone is flat. There's no requirement that the inductance is flat. There's everything else in the woofer can be not flat, but people demand flat sensitivity response. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's, not the, uh, that's not the best way to look at it. And I'll show you in a minute uh, what I think is a really good way to look at it. So uh, this is a simulated sensitivity of the same woofer box combination with varying BL. And you can see uh, the graph is actually really small vertical. It's like uh, every division is half a dB. So it's not as big a change as it appears to be. But you can see that as you add BL, the blue curve, which is a BL around 20, uh, is uh, droopier. And you'll say, oh, well, shit, I've got way less low frequency output than I, I was hoping to get. Uh, as I added BL, so I, I don't want high BL. Um, uh, but remember, we're not looking at power. Uh, people call this curve one watt, one meter, but it's not. It's 2.83 volts, one meter. And so as you add that BL, the volts are going into a higher impedance, um, and you're you're getting less current, which leads to less output. So it's a combination. Uh, it, it's it, if you could draw the, drive the same amount of current maybe the output wouldn't drop, but people don't drive current, they drive volts. Uh, also a thing to think about is on this uh, previous slide back here, I was talking about BL stability. So this woofer has a pretty stable BL from negative 10 to positive 10, and then it starts to change. Think about here, here's BL10, BL15, BL, BL20. If you've got a woofer that doesn't have a really stable BL curve, and then you start to drive it, suddenly your box response is going to change by that much as the coil comes out of the gap. So you want it to be as, as stable as possible so that the response doesn't change the second you start to move the coil a little bit. So here's the impedance that I'm talking about. Here's the same simulation, same woofer box combination. Um, and you can see as you add BL, the impedance goes up a lot. Uh, in this case, actually, the the distance between lines is uh, 5 ohms, so it's really hard to see what's going on down there at uh, 50 hertz, where uh, the, the box resonance is. But you can see uh, on either side of the box resonance this really incredible change, like 50 ohms change in, in driver impedance as a result of adding uh, BL to get up to, to 20. And so if it at 25, you know, at, yeah, 25-ish hertz, it was 25 ohms before, now it's 80, 85 ohms. So that voltage you were putting in before is now putting in really almost no power. And if you zoomed in down at uh, FS uh, for the system, you would see that uh, at 50 hertz, it still goes up by two or three ohms, which is a big deal going from six to eight or nine. And so the, the power delivered is going down a lot. So you're, you're measuring the same volts, but you're seeing a big drop in response because the power you're delivering has gone way down. So when you're uh, asking 
to have a lower BL woofer or a lot of changes that people ask for, you're sort of just doing the same job you could be doing with equalization. You're doing it in the woofer. So you're using the lower BL to get the impedance of the woofer down, and that's drawing more current. But if you put an EQ point, it would put more volts in, which would drive more current, which would get to the same result without having to compromise the woofer by, by giving it a, a weaker motor than you might want to. Most of the choices that people talk about when they talk about box design are this sort of thing, moving impedance humps and peaks around, and it's something that you can really have a strong effect on with equalization in many cases. Um, if you sort of think about the final system response instead of um, just the sensitivity response. So this is a, a woofer, this is a mid-range we actually made. And this is where it starts to get interesting for me. This is a uh, 10 NSM 76. It's a 10 inch sealed back mid-range response from around 240, 50 hertz. Um, and uh, as you can see, we changed the motor structure uh, and then remeasured the woofer. Uh, and that's kind of hard to do without changing anything else. So it's not perfect. But you can see as we add BL from 20 to 27, the impedance goes up considerably. And the, uh, the width of that peak, which is the, tells you how, how much damping, how much uh, QES you've got. Um, also, it gets wider. And so you've got a, a better damped, uh, much, much more efficient uh, woofer as you add the BL. Um, so here's uh, the raw kind of one watt, one meter response, um, which is just constant voltage. And you can see the same result we were talking about earlier, that as you add uh, the, as you add BL, so you go from 20 to 25 to 27, you can see that, that curve where I've circled it the 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 curve drops by uh, two or three db uh, and so if you're trying to get the most response there you might say oh well shit this is going the wrong direction of course if you look away from resonance to the right of the graph you can see that there's an immediate uh, gain in sensitivity up there that reflects um, more of the sort of real world results you can get as you add bl once you're away from the confounding uh, resonance uh, suck down um, so you, you can see above 500 hertz, basically. The, the results you should be expecting below 500 hertz, but the impedance has changed so much below 500 hertz because it's around resonance that uh, it confounds the results. So long story short, very long story short, what if we sort of multiplied the sensitivity by the impedance to try and make uh, a real power curve? And we did. So this is what happens if you calculate the real, uh, I guess it's not real because it's calculated, but if you if you take the sensitivity you measured with constant voltage and you adjust for impedance to try and make it into constant power, uh, what do you see in the transducer? Um, and you can see that basically going from 20 to 27 BL, uh, there's a 3 dB gain in efficiency, which equates to a 3 dB gain in sensitivity once you adjust for the changes in impedance. Uh, across the entire bandwidth of the transducer, more or less. You don't really see it down at FS because FS is a little um, complex, and, and uh, um, so you'll have to trust me. <laughs> uh, anyway, that doesn't have anything to do with maximum output, um, and a lot of people will try to conjecture maximum output from uh, low voltage, low wattage sensitivity traces. I don't really recommend it. Uh, I recommend getting a transducer and blowing it up repeatedly, which is what we do to find out maximum output. But uh, long story short, more BL is always better. It's it's free. It's not like in an engine where to add horsepower or torque, you'd need to add cylinders or weight, or you need to get a diesel or turbocharger to make some other trade-off. The only trade-off um, you need to make in terms of getting more BL is, is uh, cost, that you add some cost for more magnet or more steel. Maybe weight. Um, but it, you can add BL without adding MMS or uh, change of the suspension at all. You can you can get a much higher performance transducer just by adding BL. Um, so uh, I just am hoping that the takeaway from this particular presentation is that people um, think about the system as a whole, that they think about efficiency, not just sensitivity, and that as long as you can get the end result you want, um, 
So if you include equalization as a tool from the beginning, uh, and it is the best tool we have available to flatten response, uh, you can make a, a better system. So if you take your two systems, one that's got your, your perfectly flat sensitivity response, and then you take one that you've equalized to have a, a final response that's the same, but starts with a much stronger woofer, uh, I think you'll hear the difference immediately that the sound quality is way, way better and the durability is better. Uh, and also you can use a really small box, which is pretty critical to our touring customers. So please don't compromise your, your woofer design to try and avoid equalization. Equalization is great. It's not a crutch. It's a tool you should consider from the beginning, just like uh, your low noise ports and your, your very strong transducer. Um, if you consider them all as a system, you'll be able to get the highest performance and the best sound quality in the end. Um, because strong woofers in little enclosures are not flat and never will be. And the better you make them, the less flat they'll be. But you can equalize them until they're uh, much more, uh, until they're flat. And then the response you get in the end is actually, uh, requires a lot less power, but does require high voltage amplifiers. But again, pretty much you should be able to uh, buy them. Yeah, Brian, I think you can, you can buy a high voltage enough amplifier for sure today. So I don't think... Uh, uh, I made a joke. It wasn't a joke the other day. Somebody was talking about the X4L from PowerSoft and how uh, big an amp it is. And, you know, oh boy, that's even enough for any subwoofer. And I said that it's about enough for our 15 NDL88, which is uh, 15 for kind of line array two way applications. And uh, I'm not kidding that that's enough volts to drive a pair, uh, not bridged. Um, but uh, once you apply the equalization and put in a really small box, you need a lot of volts. You're not pushing much power. You're hardly pushing any power, like 100, 200 watts. But you need a lot of volts so that you can put the EQ in, and that's how you get the uh, the extra performance out. Uh, and it drives up cost, too. Yeah. Uh, then again, I don't think that cost in transducers is really... Uh, I, I would like to sell more expensive transducers because we can make them better by making them more expensive. But... Uh, that seems to be a very hard push and one that I uh, occasionally have luck with, with some people who uh, are willing to take a leap of faith. Because in the end, uh, the transducer is really the hardest part to improve. And so if you spend a little more money there, you can really in improve the performance of your box. And you can use a smaller box which is cheaper. In the end, I don't think it's uh, um, uh, Nikolai. Uh, I think because you were, yeah, it's a... You're, you're building more of a subwoofer system, and the, the TBX100 is a subwoofer. I think, again, that's a case where if you looked at the LSI, it would be more obvious. Uh, all right. Uh, well, here we are at an, an hour and... Sorry, not an hour and 43 minutes. 43 minutes, which I think is long enough for me to talk to everybody. Uh, so if there's any more Q&A, uh, please feel free to ask me either offline, bprescott at bcspeakers.com, or uh, in the chat comments here, and I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Everybody have a really 